So if, if uh, we're going to start now, so please uh, mute yourself for the moment. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang saranam gachami, dhammang saranam gachami, sanghang saranam gachami, dutiyampi buddhang saranam gachami, dutiyampi dhammang saranam gachami, dutiyampi sanghang saranam gachami, tatiyampi buddhang saranam gachami, Tatiampi damang saranang gachami. Tatiampi sanggang saranang gachami. Panati pata viramani sikha padang samadhyami. Adinna dana viramani sikha padang samadhyami. Kami sumi chachara viramani sikha padang samadhyami. Musa wada veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sura meraya maja pamadathana veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, now let us prepare ourselves for a short meditation. On the breath, the breath is where all the answer to the Dharma lies. When we understand the breath, we understand the Dharma. Watching the breath means you're watching impermanence. So there are many ways we can look at the breath. Today we're going to look at it in the traditional way. Watching the breath, we start by counting it. The counting helps us to push away immediate distractions. Today we'll do uh, another kind of counting. As when you breathe in, one, out, one. Breathe in two, up two. Breathe in three, up three. Breathe in four, out four. In five, out five. Sometimes this is called counting in pairs. And then you start all over again. One to five, one to five. Now you can count up to 10 if you wish, but don't go beyond 10, it's too big. Don't go less than five, it's too small. You can choose any number between five and eight, if you like. Anytime you forget a number or you overcome, just start all over again from one. After every count, Smile inwardly, the smile, the happiness helps you to focus. When there are distractions, you can also smile at the distraction and let it go. Go back to the breath. So count your breath in pairs. Breathe in one, breathe out one. Breathe in two, breathe out two. And so on.
Now for those of you who for any reason may not like the counting or you can't do the counting, that's all right, it's quite natural. There are some people who do not like the counting. In that case, you go straight to the second stage, the in-out stage. If the counting is good for you, you can go on counting for as long as you need until you feel focused, you feel calm, then switch to in, out. In the in, out stage, we do not count anymore. When the breath has come in, simply note it as in. When the breath has gone out, simply note it as out. Keep your breath natural, relax. As you watch your breath, your breath will become more peaceful. As long as you don't force the breath, normal breathing. But notice the breath becoming more peaceful, the breath will slow down. Some people, for some people, the breathing can slow down quite fast. Others it may take a bit more time. Or sometimes in one person it can be fast, it can be slow. So don't worry about that. Deal with whatever happens at that time. Breathe in, in, out, smile. In, out, smile. Feel the peace of the breath. Feel the joy of the breath. If you do this properly, your breath will slow down naturally. You will notice there is a space. Sometimes the space can be short, sometimes it can be long, it's not regular. When you notice a space between your breath, Smile at it, smile at the space. In space, out space, smile. You can smile anytime. If you don't notice the space yet, it's all right. Just go on counting or watching in out. Even if you sit down the whole session, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, all you do is just count. It's still good because when you come out of it, you will feel peaceful. Now, when you notice the space growing longer, that is good. Let it grow longer. Don't do anything. Just observe. In other words, the breath seem to stop. 
smile at it. If you notice any thoughts coming, then you can gently whisper peaceful, peaceful, just to clear the thought away or smile at the thought. Often enough, when the space arises, you may not feel the body. You just feel this peacefulness. Let that happen. When you don't feel the body, you don't feel pain, which means you will be able to sit longer. So this is the third stage. In, space, out, space. You still say in, out, feel the space, smile at it. As the space gets longer, you find a space it is becoming even more peaceful and you don't want to say anything at all. You don't want to say in out or so because it's so peaceful. This is stage four, the silent stage. Silent, don't say anything. Just feel the peacefulness and smile. This is a lifelong practice, so as you practice over time, you will begin to feel the peacefulness even more. So take your time. When the peace is really complete, you don't have to say anything. You just feel very good and peaceful. And the time will pass very quickly. Before we end, just a couple of tips. During your meditation, if you hear any sounds, no matter where it comes from, it, comes, it all comes from the ear. In meditation, sound arises at the ear door. When you hear any sound, focus your mind there and simply note sound, sound, smile, sound, sound, smile, like that. Note it simply as sound, let it go. When thoughts arise, all kinds of thoughts, you want to do this, you want to do that, simply note them as thinking, thinking, smile, thinking, thinking, smile, go back to the breath. When it comes to discomfort, discomfort, 
simply note it as it is. Pain, pain, numbness, numbness. Sometimes there's a little tiny crawling feeling on the face, maybe it's a feeling, feeling, smile. It's all impermanent. It will go away. If you sit a little wrongly, there may be pain. Then it's wise to slowly adjust yourself rather than suffer the pain which may hurt you. That is why it's important to sit properly at the start. Now at this stage, review your practice. Review your practice. Remember the peaceful moments, joyful moments, those parts that you feel good. Remember them, they will help you in your future meditations. Whenever you need inner peace, review your practice. There are difficulties, not them. Then you reflect on how to overcome, overcome them the next time, how to deal with the distraction and so on. So all this is part of review. Now we are, before we end this meditation, just open your eyes slowly. This is just sitting, so spend a couple of minutes just sitting, doing nothing in particular before we come out of meditation. We begin our meditation slowly, gently. We end our meditation slowly, gently also. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Very good. Now we can begin with our study for tonight. In this session, this is lesson four. Uh, we're going to, in this series on uh, training for the path, we're going to look at right view. The path, of course, is the eightfold path, the middle way. Uh, so, in this series of talks, not just uh, learning theory but we're also going to practice. And th that is to help us realize or understand uh, what we really are in the nature of real true reality, theory, practice, realization. So that's what the path is about. So now, when, when we talk about a four path, of course, we know the, the very first limb, anga, limb or factor, the, the, uh, the number one is right view. In fact, right view is the beginning and the end of the path. So we begin with what is called the worldly right view, the right view we understand from talks, we, we guess about it, we have views about it. In fact, you can say that uh, all that we know about Buddhism so far has been wrong in speaking, we think it is right, but actually it's not really right. It's like you know someone, you think you know someone, but as, as you, over the years, you find that the person changes, something like that. So you're not wrong also. It's just that things change, people change. So our views also change. As we mature, our views also change because our, under our understanding improves. So this is the meaning of letting go of the Dharma. If you look at the Alagadupa Masuta, the parable of the water snake discourse, the Buddha says we have to let go of the Dharma also. So this is one of the meaning. We have to let go of views. 
So there's no such thing as you, you are stuck with one view your whole life. There's only one view. That's called dogma. Nothing has changed. It's fixed. That, that's why in Buddhism we say there are no dogmas. Because all these teachings we learn, they are steps on the path. They are right for the moment. Remember, they are right for the moment. They are right for you. They are right for me for the moment. But then as we mature, as we know more teachings, as we experience life more, as we age, we put more things together. We say, oh, there's something more to this. There's something more to this. So we let go of the old view because we see something new. Remember, the Dharma is the path. We are traveling on this path. So that's another meaning of the path. We are moving. Moving means you see the scenery around you changing. Like it or not, you have to see that view. You cannot say, oh, I want to stop and just look at this view. This is the one I want and you're stuck there. You can't. You move on because you want to reach your destination. So this is the meaning of impermanence. All right. So right view, Sama Diti, right? Sama means right, okay? Sama, uh, very uh, close to Latin summa. From the words, from the prefix summa, you get words like summit. Summit means the top, the top of the mountain, the goal that you reach. Uh, you, you have the word consummate, all right? That means fulfill, all right? So the, the Samma has a sense of uh, rightness. There's supposed to be a macron over the last A, Samma, long feminine, A is missing. Uh, diti here means something that you see, a, a view, Samma Diti. Yeah? So this idea of seeing is very important in Buddhism. You have the word Diti meaning seeing and Dasana also means seeing. They, they come to the same root, but they're two different words with, with a very close meaning of seeing. To see something meaning you experience it for yourself. The Buddha teaches us, but we have to experience it ourselves. That is the meaning here. Yeah. Of course, after the Buddha, Buddhism began to change. When Buddhism went to China, especially, yeah, people are too busy. You know, just the, the masses, the peasants are too busy. They, they're not well educated. They can't understand the teachings. So some of these teachers try to simplify this, but in doing so, it, it became a kind of a normal, normal self-help religion. It becomes, I do for you. It becomes like those God religions. You just pray, your problems will be answered. Here, prayer means you look for an outside agency, something outside, you ask for help. But the problem started within us. If the problem starts within us, we, we must correct it within us. That is why mindfulness helps. We look within ourselves and, and we deal with that way of thinking. We, we deal with that attitude and we overcome the problem. That's the meaning of self-reliance. So this is the natural way of dealing with reality. Okay. So another way of putting it is directly seeing the four truths. Directly seeing, very important. You see for yourself. I'm telling it to you now. So, so in, in a sense, that's not enough. I'm telling you, like, you say, hey, look this way. Uh, there's something here you should look at. Then you look at it. You see? So you directly experience for yourself, seeing. And of course, we know the four truths very well, but how come we're still not enlightened? Because all that we know is theory. Theory. Okay, so let's look at this next one. Uh, so this right view is knowledge, according to the Satcha Vibhanga Sutta, M141. Satcha means truth, it's very nice to remember, Pali. Satcha, you know, in English, such, right? Such means such it is, that's the truth, okay? So Satcha. Vibhanga means analysis. It is caused on the analysis of the truths or, or truth, if you like. So according to this sutta, right view 
is simply knowledge, but it's a special kind of knowledge. Nyana, okay, nyana. It's not philosophical knowledge, it is spiritual knowledge. Spiritual knowledge means direct knowing, direct knowing. There's no doubt about it because it's just like when you put your hand in fire and you, you feel the heat, you burn, you, it burns and you quickly pull it back. It's a fact. You don't have to argue. You put your hand in the fire and say, let me think, is it burning my hand or not? You go, oh, it's burning. You immediately pull it back. So that's jnana, okay? Spiritual knowledge, if you like. And that is a full understanding of the four truths. Now, we know the four, first truth is suffering. We, we, we all know that, you know. But do we really? Do we actually experience suffering? Do we see it as suffering? So the next time something bad happens, it can be anything, you know, something as simple as losing a thing, you, you just tell yourself, wow, okay, this is the time, let me reflect, this is the, this is the feeling, we don't like it, and, and this is a nasty feeling, you feel it, that is, the, your lesson is teaching you, that's what it really is, underlying everything, it's there, it's just that we don't feel it all the time. We only notice it when something precious is lost or destroyed or not working the way we want it to. So this is the nature of suffering. According to the Buddha, it teaches us. That's the whole idea why suffering is put first. It teaches us that this is the reality that you must that we must face. This is the first truth. Then of course we don't stop there. We say what's going on here? And then we look for the solution and then we work at it. So th those are the four truths. Right? So there we all are familiar with this. It is the knowledge of suffering, it's the knowledge of the arising of suffering, it is the knowledge of the ending of suffering, it is the knowledge of the way leading to the ending of suffering. These are the four. Now, remember, you know, when we, I've been studying all these things for the last 50 years, and, and it, it never bores me. Every time I tell myself, there's something new here. So we should never say, oh, I know this already. I heard this already. Uh, and then we stop learning. See? Because you will be surprised. To me, it's really silly to say, oh, I already know this. Imagine you know someone, then you say, oh, I already know this person. I don't need to know this person anymore. <laughs> and that's rather odd, isn't it? Because every moment you see this person, it could be your partner, it could be a close friend, it could be a relative. There is something new to learn about this person. This person is changing. So we cannot say, oh, I know enough about this person. I don't need to know anymore. Then the person is dead. That would be silly to think that way, right? The person is alive. So you've got to keep on knowing, keep on knowing. In fact, even after the person is dead, you might realize, oh, wow, I didn't really know this person well. Now looking back, there's so much things I have learned. Then you are wiser. So this is the nature of direct learning and the uh, nature of the Four Noble Truths, okay? So we, we've got to tell ourselves we need to keep on learning. Otherwise, there is this ignorance, this pall of ignorance, this wall of ignorance blocking us from seeing reality. So ignorance means not directly knowing the Four Noble Truths, meaning indirectly knowing also is ignorance. You, you don't really know it for yourself. It's still ignorance. Or maybe we call it delusion. You, know, you think you know, but actually there are so many other things which are not there, right? So directly knowing means when there is suffering, you watch it. You don't run away from it. You, you, you don't say, oh, I don't have to think about it. Acknowledge it. Notice it. What is going on here? That's the meaning of directly knowing. So wisdom, the opposite wisdom, is fully understanding the Four Noble Truths. You begin to understand, for example, uh, when something nice happens to you, feel good, 
you reflect on it, you say, wow, mm-hmm. okay, this is wonderful. I'm very happy, but you know, all these things don't last long. And you know? also when this goes away, uh, we'll, we'll be feeling just the opposite. It's not that you feel sad. No, you don't feel sad after that. You, you become more realistic. In a way, you value the moment more. When you know someone you love and care for is impermanent, you would value that person more, for example. So that's the meaning here. Understanding the nature of suffering, understanding the nature of impermanence, understanding the nature of non-self. These are very profound teachings, which we will go through as we move along. So when we fully understand the, the, the four truths, we see the truth inside us, we see the truth in other people, we see the truth all around us. And, and uh, as long as we see this way, it's direct experience. Otherwise, we have what is called the theory of it, which is also good. I mean, in a sense, like today, as you sit in the comfort of your homes, you're listening to me, you're getting the theory of it. In other words, the, the Dharma as teaching, Ariyati. Okay? Now, even Dharma is teaching, there is the pari in front. Pari means it's like peri, like parimeter, that means all around. Okay? Pariyati, right? you grasp it all around. So this is the, 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 the full teaching, not just teaching, full teaching, the complete theory. Okay? So we, we try to understand it more completely from our experience. And from our experience means you put into practice or you watch it when it happens to you. Pati pati. Pati here means like counter. As it happens, you respond to it. As it arises, you respond to it. Okay? Pati has the sense of re, uh, count, it, reacting to it, okay? responding to it. So practice means watching impermanence as it arises around you right now. As you look at the screen, things are changing, right? And, and very soon all this is over, right? And then you, you reflect on it. And when you reflect on it, there is this realization, Pati Veda, you, there is this breakthrough, there is this cracking of the eggshell, it's like this chicken, you know, the chicken's in, little chicken inside the egg. Mm. This little chicken has got a special protection on the beak and uses the beak to pack through the shell from inside. Mm. Picks, breaks the shell and comes out. That's called breakthrough. In fact, breakthrough is also a word for attaining stream winning. So ultimately realization means attaining stream winning because you understand the nature of impermanence so clearly, you are no more uh, cheated by it, so to speak. You become a stream winner. But if, if you are not your streamer, you can still understand and say, well, this is impermanence, everything changes, so I should not get attached to it. So there, there is that helpful wisdom working for you. So theory, practice, realization. These are the three good truths that help us understand the Buddha's teaching. These are the three levels of our understanding of the Buddha's teaching as we move along. Of course, the, the last part is the best, but you've got to go through all three stages step by step. That is why we are having this talk, this class. And the next thing is the ball is in your court, as we say. You go on to practice it, right? Then it becomes you. In other words, you experience it for yourself and then something wonderful happens. You go through a change, a transformation. You become wiser, calmer, happier, and you're able to make others calmer, happier, freer. So we're talking about the Four Noble Truths here. Yeah. We all know very well, I'm sure all of you know the Four Noble Truths, right? The first truth is suffering. Second truth is arising of suffering. Third truth, ending of suffering. Fourth truth is Nirvana. But there is another model, okay? So let's look at the familiar one first. This is the one you're familiar with. This is called a teaching model. One, two, three, four. Right? Because the, the suttas are teaching us, so the teaching model is very well known. So this is a range of one, two, three, four. Now, suffering dukkha, all right? Uh, uh, ka, 
his the root the root actually is kan kechen, meaning something like to tolerate, to be patient with. Do the prefix do means something difficult, difficult to tolerate, something that we do not enjoy. Okay, so here there are three kinds of suffering, uh, different ways of looking at it. Eh? For example, we, we can say there is suffering in the sense world, suffering of the form world, suffering of the formless world, if you like. So that, no, as long as we are, we are born, there is suffering. Okay. Uh, then th this suffering arises Sometimes some teachers use the word, the cause of suffering. We don't normally use cause in, in early Buddhism uh, because the suffering is not caused by anything. When the conditions are there, it arises, basically. For example, we, we don't, don't exactly, it's not exactly right to say uh, oil caused the fire. Of course, when we read that in the papers, it means the oil was the main factor, is it? But we know the many other factors that come together to create this fire. So what we normally use in, in, in Buddhist lingo, Buddhist talk is conditions. Conditions. When the conditions are right, this situation arise. So when the conditions are right or rather conditions are wrong, so you notice here you can use either right or wrong, they mean the same thing. This is the <laughs> the irony in, in, in spiritual language. When the conditions are right or when the conditions are wrong, suffering arises. Okay. Now you look at the word samun daya. How do you resolve this? Meaning, how do you break up this word? You have sam or san, similar to con or com in, in English. Udaya. Okay. Udaya means arise. So some has this idea of like togetherness, there are different parts coming together and then something arise. So, so from the Pali, we, we kind of uh, have a good idea what's the best way to translate into English. So the arising of suffering, not really something caused uh, suffering. So if you say arising of suffering, you'll find you can easily talk quite naturally in, in this case. So, uh, is craving, as we say, causes us to be, uh, to, to have the state of unsatisfactoriness because we want this, we want that. And whenever we want this, we want that, we also don't like this, we don't like that. So that is called craving, right? So craving has this pulling effect and pushing effect. And then when we are unable to notice whether we like or don't like it, then, then there is this what's called, uh, we totally neglect it, we, we ignore it, right? So we don't care about it. So we act in three ways. If, if we see something we like, we are drawn to it, then we feed the unconscious tendency of lust or of desire, okay? When you, when you allow it just to like like that. And when you hate it, there is this hating, dislike, then we feed the unconscious tendency, anusaya, the latent tendency of ill will or repulsion, dislike. If we ignore, like in meditation, we just we ignore what is arising in our minds because we don't know what it really is, then we feed ignorance, ignorance arises. So this, well, this is how the three roots arise in us through this not knowing how to respond. The proper way to respond, the, the rule of thumb, as we say, the simple way is to reflect on something, whether we like it, we don't like it, or it, uh, neither, as being impermanent, then we are safe. If we see something pleasant, we say impermanent. We see something unpleasant, impermanent. And we see something which is neither neutral, impermanent, then we are safe. That is why I like to mention the practice, the mindfulness of impermanence again and again. It's the easiest practice for lay people. Practice impermanence. Whatever still arises, reflect on it. You won't be wrong. Okay. So this is dealing with the arising of suffering. 
So when you go on watching that way, you find suffering passes away. That's called niroda, ending of suffering, niroda. Okay? It goes away. That is the momentary nirvana of the situation. It doesn't last forever, so we cannot call it the nirvana in the normal sense of the word. Okay? But that is an idea of nirvana. It's not nirvana, but it's an idea of nirvana. So you want to know what nirvana is? It's not difficult at all. When your anger disappears, that's nirvana. We can say the anger has gone to nirvana if you like. It's a poetic way of saying, but don't take it too seriously. Okay? It's a nice way to say, oh, my anger has gone to nirvana, but nirvana is not a place. So anger can't go there. So it's as if anger is a thing. You know, we, Once you think in terms of a thing, so, uh, yeah. it, it, it is wrong. You know, but, um, so you let it pass. Yeah. Okay? So then uh, you go on practicing this, there is the path. You go on you go on looking at the first street truth again okay. and you move on along the, the, the path. Okay? All right. Okay, let's start. Somebody's microphone is on. Can you please mute your microphone? Somebody's microphone is on. Please mute it. Okay, so right, so those are the four noble truths uh, in, in terms of practice. All right, now let's look at a different model now. This is the, the older model, okay? This is the practice model. This is very rare. It is found very rare. I think probably one of the few places is perhaps the only place Maha Salaya Tanika Sutta, M149, section 11. It's found in a few places in that sutta. And then you can look at ST41.9, section 2.4 for the notes. So here you notice uh, the arrangement is one, two, four, three. Well, why, you may wonder, right? First, of course, the Buddha said, you look around, what do you see? People are never satisfied with anything. That's the nature of life. And this is because of craving, number two. And so what do we do next? There is this way of overcoming suffering. There is the path, right? So the path comes first. We, we walk the path. And then we reach the goal, ending, which is nirvana. You notice the ending is nirvana. You know, the, the, for, for many years, I wondered how come in this Four Noble Truth, Nirvana first and then the path, right? The goal first and then the path. Shouldn't be logically there's the path and then you have the goal, right? I don't know how many of you have thought that way. You, you look at the Four Noble Truth and you start wondering how come three and four are put like that? Shouldn't be, it be four and three? So one, one day a few years ago, I discovered, oh, there is this model which is one, two, four, three. I said, wow, this really makes good sense. If you look at it, the path and then the ending and then nirvana, see? So this is the, the practice model. When you practice, this is the sequence. But in terms of teaching, the path is put first so that you know where to go, how to go, and then you reach the goal, you see? So, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the goal is mentioned before the path because you, you are told, okay, this is what the goal is like. Uh, this is where you are supposed to go to, to this ancient city called Nirvana. And then the Buddha says, okay, here's the path. Follow this ancient path and you reach. So goal comes first. The Buddha teaches about how suffering ends and then how to get there. So this is a teaching model. So, so I'm sure you understand this clearly enough. Okay, if not, make a note. Uh, ask again during question time. So this is the not word truth, two models of them. Eh? Right, now we come to the two kinds of right view. When we talk about right view also, we have two kinds. Remember I told you earlier on, uh, right view is the beginning of the path as well as the ending of the path. So there's already two kinds of right view. 
In fact, this is what we're talking about. Uh, the beginning kind of right view, the preliminary right view is the one that you and I think we understand. But our goal is to see clearer and ever clearer through direct experience, the right view that is the goal, that's, that is Nirvana, if you like. So what are these two kinds? The first one is called the mundane view, Lokia. So the, the kind of understanding we have of the of things, of the Dharma, of reality, is the worldly right view. Because we are not awakened yet, so we are still looking at it in a uh, mundane way. Now the Mahachattari Sakasutta M117 defines the mundane right view as follows. Okay, so this is the textbook definition, if you like, or shall we say the Sutta, uh, sutta definition of right view. Bhikshus, bhikshus are the monks. To the monks, the Buddha addresses us today. There is the right view with influxes. Okay, right view with influxes. We all have our influxes, influx through the six senses, through the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. The experiences are going through our senses. Okay, so they, these are influxes and they, they create this idea of, of existence, of craving, and we have views, but we, we are still, we still do not know what really is going on. So these are the influxes. Influx of our senses create this world for us. Okay, and the Arhat has overcome all these influxes. The, the, result of the senses, sense objects and working on us, right? Creating this idea of craving, of existence, of views and ignorance. Partaking of merit, we think of, oh, this is good, this is bad, and I want to have more merit, or at least be born in heaven and so on, you know, that kind of idea of partaking of merit. It ripe, ripening in birth basis. Notice the bracket says acquisition of aggregates. The square brackets uh, either expand on the idea or give you an alternate translation. If you're not sure of the meaning which is highlighted in both, you can look at the square brackets. It gives you a, another meaning to help you understand better. Okay, they mean the same thing, more or less. Ripening in birth basis, in other words, you are reborn your karma follow you. This karma are your karmic genes. It cause you to be born again and again. And it's the aggregates that keep re-arising in us. The five aggregates form, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness. And we are studying the five aggregates in detail in the other series, okay? The body, mind, and meditation series, BMM series, every uh, Saturday, uh, or Sunday rather, right? Sunday, uh, 10 a.m. So uh, every, uh, is it last Sunday, first Sunday, right? Okay. No. Uh, sorry, last, last Sunday. Sunday. Last Sunday of every month. Okay, that is on the five aggregates. Uh, on the fourth Sunday. Fourth Sunday of every month, we will look at the aggregates, how they arise, how they are acquired. So, okay, so this, this, uh, this first kind of right view has got all these things. It is the way of thinking of the unawakened person, basically. And then one more point about merit before we go on. Uh, as unawakened beings, uh, practitioners, we tend to see merit as things. And as you know, Qingming is coming, right? Fifth of April, traditionally regarded as grave sweeping day. And uh, the Chinese are very filial, or those who are filial, they, they will go to the traditional graves and sweep clean, remove all the shrubs and undergrowth, repaint all the Chinese characters on, on the tomb. And, and in a sense, it's done with pride because that's it, it's like a, a record of their ancestry. Of course, in Singapore, most, 
mostly there's a lot of cremation so we, we go to the small little columbarium and also basically we still show respect uh, in, in remembrance of the dead uh, but the, the, there's a lot of uh, wrong practices going on you know for, uh, over the centuries things got mixed up for example there is a lot of burning things, papers, and so on. we don't do that. The Buddha doesn't teach us to burn all these things. This is unnecessary. It's polluting the air. It's, it causes ill health to us, bad health. So don't do this. And believe me, the, the ancestors do not receive these things, and they don't need these things. So this is wrong view, thinking that you can send all these hell notes uh, with such so many zeros to, to hell, you know. So that's wrong view. The idea here is that there are no dead ancestors. The right view is there are no dead ancestors. They all reborn elsewhere. So all you are hanging to is this memory. Yes, we want to show respect to our ancestors. Yes, that is good. You, you hold them in dear memory. But remember, if you understand Buddhism clear enough, they are already reborn. They could, I mean, if they're good people, they're reborn as devas. Otherwise, they could be reborn in suffering state. It's when they, they are stuck in the world of the pretas that we can help them through our loving kindness. Very important. So we cannot transfer merit. This is one of the very serious wrong things which the singlist, some singlist monks have been teaching us all this for the last century, which must be corrected. And they're still doing it. Only yesterday I saw one advertisement saying that, oh, you know, this is a time for us to transfer merits to the dead by sending money to Sri Lanka, to a temple there. So that's rather odd. Why not, you know, use that money, go old folks home, you know? So it's, we don't transfer merits. There's only, there's only transfer of funds here, which is wrong. There is dedication of merit. Nowhere in the suttas is there teaching of transfer of merits. There is dedication in a sense. I mean, merit cannot be transferred. It's not a thing. Okay? You create this joy inside you, this loving kindness inside you. You reflect on the ancestor, the deceased, all the good things this person has done. And then you say, may you be well, may you be happy. And you send these thoughts to them. That's called dedication of marriage. And there are suttas like the Tirokuda Sutta, the, the Sadda Janusoni Sutta, which tell us how all this works very clearly. So that's right view, right? We dedicate marriage. We don't see marriage as things, okay? Okay, that's a little diversion, but it's important to understand your right view. So, it is a mundane view there. Let's look at the next one. Okay, here we are. This is the sutta definition. What is right view? It is the view that there is what is given, what is offered, what is sacrificed. So in other words, when you give something, it is good. Someone really benefits. You notice when you give something, if you're calm, you, you have a sense of peace and joy inside you. So there is something which is given, something which is offered, something sacrificed. Sacrifice meaning given away by way of uh, either through prayers or even an act of charity. So th there is goodness in giving, to put it very simply. The second point about uh, mundane right view is that there is the fruit and result of good and bad actions, that the karma, okay? Good and bad do have repercussions, do come back to us. Of course, uh, sometimes this gets oversimplified. If you look in the sutta, there's only one passage which, which says uh, that karma is uh, do good, get good, do bad, get bad, right? So it's oversimplified. It's not that simple. Actually, that statement where uh, where you 
do good, you get good, do bad, you get bad. It's part of a curse that the seers, these rishis, this uh, holy man used against the asuras who were, who were fighting the gods. And then they, in doing so, the asuras will kind of, you know, go through the this village of the seers, this holy man, and destroy the village, you know, and they rampage, you know. So the, he was this holy man telling the rishis, uh, telling the asuras, please don't come this way, please don't destroy our village. No, but the asuras refuse to listen. So this uh, seers, this holy man, put a curse on, on the leader, uh, and this leader got this terrible nightmare. And the story goes. So you find the Sangyuta does this story about karma defined as good begets good, evil begets evil. It's much more than that. When you do something good, it's like a lightning rod. You know? So once you put up a lightning rod, whenever there's lightning, it will strike. Sometimes more than one zap of lightning, right? So in other words, when you do something good, you don't just get one, one to one. You, you can get a lot back. Maybe you get less back, usually much more. When it comes to something negative, it's been more clear. It never rains but falls. The moment something bad happens, it attracts more bad things. So it works like that. So it's not good because good. Good because more good or bad because more bad. And it can happen anytime, again and again. As long as you have not got rid of the karma, this cycle will happen. So the karma is like that. Okay, But the essence, the meaning is that, that the there are results of good and bad actions. Sometimes we say, oh, you know, you look around this world, you see all the bad people prospering, you see good people suffering, right? Maybe, maybe that's why it seems. But it, the people who hurt other people, who harm other people, they're not happy people. You know, they're really suffering inside. So, do not delude yourself by saying, oh, you know, only bad people and prosper, good people suffer. They seem to do so in this world, but in the next world, in the future, their future life, they, they will pay for it. They, they, they are bad habits, karma is habit we create for ourselves, will work on us, all right? So here, Karma doesn't just work now, it also works in the future, in the next world, next life, wherever we go. So that's the meaning here. Oh, now there is father, there is mother. This is another important right view. So imagine the wrong view is just opposite. There are some teachers, materialist, materialist teachers who say, oh, there's no father, no mother, you know, it's just a, an idea. So there is father, there is mother, meaning there is family. There is, uh, there should be respect for elders. So there is order which makes society possible, which makes society wholesome so we can progress as human beings. And there are beings reborn, Opapatika. Now this one is a bit difficult because Opapatika is also a term used for the non-returners. But after some research, I have come to the understanding that it means there are there is rebirth. Okay? So this is the uh, meaning here because it connects with the, the one above on karma. Okay? There, there is the fruit and result of good and bad actions, number two. So there is rebirth. We are reborn. So karma and rebirth are basic teachings in Buddhism, which we, uh, which Buddhists accept. Okay? And the last one here, in this uh, mundane uh, right view, there are Brahmins and recluses who, living rightly and practicing rightly, having directly known and realized for themselves, this world and the hereafter proclaim them. Now, the Buddha often used this word Brahmins for the monks. Brahmins are the, the highest class, but to the Buddha, he says, no, you're not born Brahmin. You, through your practice, by becoming arahats, you are the real Brahmins. So here the Brahmins are the arahats. The recluses are the other monks. We can interpret this today as meaning the, those monks who are practitioners and others who practice the Dharma. 
who are uh, seriously practicing the Dhamma, okay? practitioners. The, 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 these people, it can be any one of us who really practice the Buddha's teaching. And through that practice, they understand the true reality and they become happy as a result. In other words, goodness is possible through the Dhamma, through uh, practicing the true teaching. Okay, that's the meaning. It's possible to be good, to oversimplify it a bit. Okay, so there you are. I'm going to stop here for a while for a break before we go on to the supramundane uh, right view, Mukuttara. Okay, so take a short break. You can uh, go to the convenience if you like. Okay, yeah, you can continue. Right. Now let's look at uh, the, two, uh, the man, supra mundane right view, Lokuttara. Lokuttara, Loka meaning world, Uttara means above, supra mundane. Okay. So here, we, the, again, we have the Maha Chattarisaka Sutta, the discourse in the great forties, defines supra mundane right view as follows. <clears throat> Bhikshus, there is right view that is noble, okay, Arya, noble, that means of the path without influxes. So this one has got none of those uh, uh, things which uh, cause suffering. Uh, arahats are free from all that and the supramundane. And it's a path factor. So it has to do with at least stream winner onwards, it's part of the path. So notice the earlier all those views mentioned their views, right? So, and, and those are views of the unawakened. So the awakened, they, they let go of those views. It doesn't mean they don't have those beliefs. It is natural to them so that they are normal views. And here we call this uh, faculty wisdom of, the, of these noble ones. It's wisdom, panya. It is a faculty of wisdom, indriya. Here, faculty means uh, they are stream winners, once returner, non returner. So, the, the kind of wisdom they have is, is very clear, very natural, but they're not arahats yet. In the case of the arahats, it's called power of wisdom because the understanding of the arahat is so clear, complete, and natural uh, that uh, it's, it's not just a faculty, they, it gives them spiritual power. Okay, so, they are the adept. It's called Panya Bala. Bala. Bala means power. Okay. Notice Bala is short. Bala, not Bala, no? because Bala has, has a different meaning. And it is at the awakening factor of Dhamma discernment, Dhamma Vichaya Sambo Janga. Uh, this has to do with meditation. Here, Dhamma discernment, that means Dhamma investigation. Uh, this, this, noble ones, stream winners upwards. They are able to quickly discern the mind, what's going on with the mind, what, uh, what are the thoughts arising and so on. That's the meaning there, yeah, the awakening effect of the uh, examination, investigation of mental states, dharma discernment, okay? Dharma vichaya, sambo janga. And they have right view as a path factor. So the right view we have is not yet the path factor. It has not brought us to the A4 path yet. It's bringing us there, but not reached yet. Whereas in the case of the stream winner, he's already reached the first step there. He's, he's going to kind of start walking. And that's called path factor, attainment. Okay, that's why it's important to aspire to stream winning in this life itself. One who makes an effort to give up the wrong view to cultivate right view, that, that this is one's right effort, right? Of course, this one is very clear with the, the noble ones, but, but we can practice it too. As long as we make an effort to let go of wrong views, we ask questions which are connected with right view, that is right effort. One who is mindful gives up wrong view and dwells cultivating right view. This is one's right mindfulness, right? So we are mindful. We ask, did the Buddha teach this? What does this mean, right? So we see this connection, right view, right effort, then come to right mindfulness. 
Thus, this, these three things run along with right view, turn around it, that is to say, right view, right effort, right mindfulness. They work together, right? So this, that's why they're called angas. So when we talk about, about the wheel, uh, we can also talk about the Dharma as a wheel, the wheel moves on the path, and this wheel has got eight spokes, right? So three of it is uh, right view, right effort, right mindfulness, they kind of work together. So now we, we have been talking about eightfold path. Actually, more when it is more complete, there, there is the tenfold path. We don't speak of the tenfold path, we, we speak of the ten rightness, okay, the ten qualities of the path. This is mentioned in the Ubangama Sutta, A10 121. What are the ten qualities of the path? First there are the eight qualities, then the two more. So first, in this regard, Bhikshu says the Buddha, right view comes first. Why does right view come first? Then Bhikshu says, how does right view come first? So now the Buddha has to explain why the path starts with right view. From right view comes right intention. When you see things rightly, then your intention is also right, also correct, also good and true. From right intention comes right speech. From right speech comes right action. From right action comes right livelihood. In fact, three, four, five, this is the moral aspect of our life, they are interconnected, okay? Notice one and two are the first two path factors. Number one is right view, number two is right intention. That is the uh, wisdom aspect, okay? So from there, you get this flow of natural spiritual action. Then, number six, from right livelihood comes right effort. From right effort comes right mindfulness. And from right mindfulness comes right concentration. Okay? So notice, in number six, right effort, that means you let go of negative things, promote the positive things, then you're able to, your mind's going to clear up. Right mindfulness, then once your mind clear up, you get focus, you get jhanas, right? So that's right concentration. So it goes like that. So there you are, we have this, these are the eightfold path, the, the eight things of, uh, eight factors of the path. What is the result, we may ask, right? So now comes the result. There you are, nine and ten are the result. From right concentration, in other words, from this uh, deep meditation comes right knowledge. So the Arahat realizes the Four Noble Truth, that's the right knowledge. And once he has mastered this right knowledge, then there is this, from right knowledge comes right freedom. It's free from the world, free from suffering. And that is awakening, nirvana. So that's called right freedom, sama vimutti. Right knowledge, sama jnana. Right, freedom, sama vimuti. So that's this is the arahat. Thus, Bhikshu says the Buddha, the learner, the learner are the stream winners, once returner, non returner. On the path is ended up with eight limbs, so the eightfold path. But the arahat has ten limbs, and the, as a set of ten, they're called the tenfold rightness, samatha. Okay, you can see. The word at the top here in the box, samatha, from samma, samma, tata, the TTA makes it into an abstract noun. Okay, now let's go back a little bit. What are the disadvantages of holding wrong views? What are the dangers given? The sala vatika lohicha sutta, D12 says, the Buddha then says, those with wrong views have one or of these two destinies. A life of habitual violence. Another way of putting it is hell state. Or constant gullibility and fear. That is the animal world. So this is what we fall into. Even in this life as humans, we are caught in this mental state of hell. Hell is a mental state. It's very real. You know, there's a saying, what is inside our minds more real than what is out there. So don't 
don't worry whether hell is a place or not because when suffering occurs in your mind it's real more real than what's out there and then there is this animal world right so uh you don't have to have four legs and a tail if our minds are negative unwholesome we are as bad as animals already in fact some animals are even noble nobler than us in that case so this is the meaning eh? wrong views bring us down to the subhuman state and we don't want to go there so the idea of the five precepts is to prevent us from falling into the subhuman states of the animals the pretas the hell states uh, suras In the Ananda Subha Sutta D10, the Buddha declares, these beings who were endowed with bad conduct of body, speech, and mind, who reviled the noble ones, meaning the Arahats, they talk bad about Arahats, they make fun of the Arahats, they held wrong views and undertook actions under the influence of wrong views after death with the bodies breaking up, had re arisen, reborn in the plane of misery, a bad destination, a lower realm in hell, suffering state in under us. Yeah? So here, what about, you know, I mean, things are not so clear cut in our in real life. We have good people. We say they're good because they do lots of social work. They, they, they are very kind, but then their private lives are different. They don't keep the precepts. So what happened to this kind of people? They don't keep precepts, but they do good things. They do good deeds. And this is uh, come from the Dasaka, the book of tens, Dasaka, Janu Sone Sutta. A10177. The Buddha says, the Buddha is talking to the Brahmin Janusoni. He says, Janusoni, uh, so, so, he says, here, Brahmin, a certain person is one who takes life, first precept broken, takes the not given, second precept, indulges in sexual misconduct, third precept, speaks false speech, speaks div divisive speech, utters harsh speech, utters frivolous talk, wrong speech. No? He is covetous, malevolent, has false views. It's a mental, wrong mental karma, bad mental karma. So altogether you have 10, this is called the 10 unwholesome causes of karma and bad habits. But, okay, look at section 12 of the Sutta. Buddha goes on and says, but he is a giver of food, drink, cloth, vehicle, garlands, scents, ointments, bed dwelling, and lights to an ascetic of Brahmin. You know, it's a good monastic practitioner. He's generous, he's charitable, he does social work and so on. So this person doesn't keep precepts, but he does good deeds. So what happens to him? What is his karma? Rebirth as a well, as well treated pets. There's no other there. Huh? With the bodies breaking up after death, such a person arises in the company of elephants. Right? Why? There he would be a recipient of food, drink, gardens, and various adornments. Because whatever giving you give is not without fruit. There's always something good in giving. So here, this person has good karma in giving, he does social work and charity and so on, but he doesn't keep the precepts. So it's reborn. Remember, when you don't keep the precepts, you fall into the subhuman states, animal state, for example. Right here, so you become an elephant and you are taking good care of, you might even be trained to dance, to perform for the children. And here you see a beautiful, well-dressed elephant walking like a human. So you'll be reborn in the company of elephants. But be well taken care of, a lot of food given, nicely dressed. Or well, you become horses. So these are pets. People love horses. They dress them up, put prices on them. And these are suttas, by the way. This is not my, my personal views, okay? They become cows. And this is quite well known in India. So they, they actually worship cows. And chickens, no? And you see this chicken really nicely dressed, right? But still chickens. So they're given nice food, drinks, garlands, and various adornments. Now you even see cats. Sometimes you see on Facebook a cat putting the paws together before the shrine and bowing down. I've even seen 
videos of dogs, you know, bowing down together with the monks. And we all marvel at it. We say, wow, look at that, how intelligent they are. But we forget where these animals come from, who they were, you see. So in the past life, they did not keep the precepts, right? So they, they, they were, they did charitable work. So they are reborn in a happy state, people take care of them, but they are animals. So, so this is the how karma works, all right? So here the Buddha is telling us, take a safe bet. How to be safe? What is the right way to choose? There is this Apanaka Sutta. The Buddha gives us uh, his wager. He says, this is the wager, this is the bet to take. When we accept, we should accept karma and rebirth. That's the bet the Buddha gives us. Accept karma and rebirth rather than reject it. If you, if you accept karma and rebirth, you have this sure bet. Because if karma and rebirth are false, we have nothing to lose because we have done nothing wrong, see? But if you uh, have done something wrong, then karma will work on you. But whether you reject karma or not, whether you believe in karma or not, whether you believe in rebirth or not, karma will still act on you. So it's better to accept karma and rebirth. So even if karma and rebirth are false, you still will not suffer because you've done nothing wrong. Now, if we reject karma and rebirth, and if karma and rebirth are true, we have a lot to lose even when we have done other good deeds, because karma will act on us, right? Now, th this wager was used later by Pascal during the 17th century, I think that that's a thousand, nearly 2000 years after the Buddha. So he used this idea, he says, why we should believe in God? Eh? He said, because if God doesn't exist, uh, it's all right, but if God exists, you'll be punished, you know, so it's, it's kind of it's use of fear and threat. So it, it doesn't work very well with the God idea, but here it works with karma and rebirth better. So this is the safe bet, why we should accept karma and rebirth rather than reject them. So think about this, okay? Otherwise you can look up 1016 again, section 1.8.5.2. Okay, so now we're coming to the, the closing already. Where wrong views, where does wrong view arise and how do we correct it? So this is a bit of summary of what, uh, you see a diagram here, a quick review. We have our senses, okay? These are the internal sense faculties, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. And then we have the sense object. We see something, hear something, smell, taste, touch, and think. Right, then we pay attention. This sense consciousness refers to attention and these three join together. So there is a triangle of experience. Okay, so this is a bit of revision. This is called sense contact or pasa. Okay, sense stimulus experience, if you like. And sensation arises in us, right? Feeling through the eye or the ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. And then there is this feeling, if we, if we see something as pleasant, right? We see something pleasant, we like it. If we see something as painful, we dislike it. If something neither pleasant nor painful, we don't care about it. So what do we do here? Okay, this is called perception. So when we perceive this, what happens? So now what do we do? How do we, this is where wrong view arises, okay? When we see something pleasant, we think, oh, I want this. When we see something painful, we say, oh, I don't want this, I hate this. And if it is neither, we don't care about it. So ignorance arises. So when something pleasant arises, reflect on it as painful. Now you may say, isn't that odd? Well, I don't know whether you've noticed this or not. When you go to a movie, you see this really nice show. By the end of it, you, you feel kind of empty, you feel a bit sad even. You feel sad because the show has ended, something good is finished, right? So something pleasant when it ends becomes painful. So you reflect this way. That's the meaning of painful here. 
And something painful, reflect on it as a dart. Say, wow, this is really painful. And this is suffering, reflect on it. And something neutral, reflect on it as being impermanent, as I mentioned earlier. If you're not sure, all three you can reflect as being impermanent, then you somehow uh, uh, kind of lessen or even remove this idea of uh, wrong view. Okay. Otherwise, craving will arise and it leads to formations, which is karma, and then suffering arises. Okay. So this is a kind of summary on how our perception works and we should learn to practice the perception of impermanence. Okay, so now the last slide. Okay, nothing is worth clinging to. This is a reminder which the Buddha gave to Mogalana. To put in modern terms, we can say, if we measure ourselves against others by what we have and what they have, other people have houses, they also want to have a house, we have cars, I also want to have a car. We measure against others, Com we compete with others. And if we were to lose what we have, then what are we? Right? So if we define ourselves by things, by what we have, then if we lose them, what are we? The answer is simply nothing, right? So the Buddha says, everything in this world, especially our feeling, is impermanent. Even our breath, we take it in, we have to give it back. Our breath is our life and we can't hold it, we can't keep it, we have to give it back. That's the only way to live, by giving back. Nothing is worth clinging to. You can't cling to your breath, your life even, you let it go. By letting go, you live, you are free. So this is a beautiful reflection. Right, so there you are. So that's that ends today's talk. And this is an advertisement for the next class on 25th April. I'll be talking about feelings, Vedana, okay, which is part of the uh, five aggregates. All right, so we're just nice. We have half an hour for questions. Okay, so now Ratna takes over. Eh? Oh, okay. Uh, un unmute, please. Yeah. Stop sharing. Eh? Yes. Right. Wait. Okay. Stop share. Oh, that's okay. nice. I can see everyone now. All right. Hello, everyone. Yes. Now it's the yeah. same time. Uh, you have any question? Uh, you can raise your hand. Yeah. We can type the question in the chat yeah. box. Uh, please uh, turn on your video also. Uh, yes, Pamuja, yes. Me again, yes. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you, Teacher Pia. Okay. Can I chat with you? Um, is Amitabha in the Sutta too? No, Amitabha is a later idea after the Buddha's time. Amit Amitabha is interesting. All, all these uh, later ideas, they have stories. So we should go back to the original, in other words. So what's Amitabha? about. Amita means immeasurable, cannot be measured. Okay. Abha means light, the Buddha of immeasurable light. There is no such personal Buddha. So th this is an idea of looking at the Buddha as the light of awakening. Right. Uh, this also, this idea also arose as an answer to a challenge from the, some Persian religion of light and dark. So because at that time, the Persian Empire was very strong and, and the Persian religion also very popular. So the, it influenced the, the later Buddhism in India. So, and it's Central Asia also. So this idea started developing in Mahayana, uh, mainly because of one king called uh, this Kush, Kushan king, uh, Kanishka. Okay, so he accepted Buddhism and he promoted Buddhism as part of his statecraft. In other words, he used Buddhism to promote his empire, his power. And he, he started allowing changes. See, because there are many other religions present in his court also. He accepts all religions. He's, 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 he's the king, he's, he's the emperor. So you see Buddhism influenced by other religions 
at that time. See, so it started there. So we don't have to go there because we are no more living in the Kushan Empire. And, and we have those days, it's very difficult for them to get the early suttas. But here we have the early suttas with, with us. We can go back, study the suttas carefully. So we should go back to the simple original teachings of the Buddha. Okay. Thank you. Mm, all right. Very good question. Oh. Okay. Next question. Brother Pierre, Siu Fong here. Yes, Siu Fong. Yeah, I'm referring to the uh, the first noble truth of suffering. It's stated okay. as three kinds. Mm. Does that refer to Sukha, Dukkha, and uh, no, no, sorry, Anicca, Dukkha, uh, and um, the Im, uh, impermanence, suffering, and um, non self? Uh, no, no, those three, they, they're called the universal characteristics. Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta are uh, universal mm. characteristics. Dukkha is the first one. Okay, the, yeah. the, all, all things are Dukkha, have the nature of unsatisfactoriness. Okay, then uh, because they, they are unsatisfactory, they are, uh, sorry, they're in, impermanence first. Okay, they're all impermanence. Because of impermanence, there is Dukkha, there is suffering. Okay. Sometimes Dukkha is put first. They, they, they're suffering because they are impermanent. So they kind of help each other. They, they're interconnected. And because things are impermanent and, and Dukkha unsuspectory, you have no control over these things. In other words, there is no self, no uh, entity, no agency behind it. No self. That, that is anatta, non-self. No? Then we go a little deeper there. Uh, all the Dhammapada says all, all things, all states are impermanent. All states, all things are dukkha. And then say all formations are non self. Okay. So here, the, the last one, according, oh, well, let me see, Sabi Sankara, Anicca, Sabi Sankara, dukkha. Sabbe Dhamma Anatta. I got to recite the Pali, it helps better. All formation, in other words, all things in the universe, form things you see around, okay, are impermanent. All the sankaras, all the formation you see around are also dukkha. But all states, Dhamma, all states are non self. So, and this one is tricky, you see. Some scholars have said, oh, uh, Therefore, nirvana is non-self, but this is wrong uh, because nirvana is not a state. We do not attribute qualities to nirvana because once you attribute quality, it means you're talking about nirvana is already conditioned, right? So nirvana is neither permanent nor impermanent. We, we cannot say there is self there or no self there. It has no attributes. It has no qualities that we talk about in, in, in the worldly sense. So we, we have to leave Nirvana out of the three characteristics in that sense, okay? Uh, so the, this last, this non-self quality means all the rules that govern the working of things around us, the nature of the universe, uh, how we live and so on, all this, there's no self behind it. There's no entity behind it. There's no... Uh, what do you call that, uh, agency, any kind of being behind it. Okay, so this last one is a bit tricky. This non-self is, is a very profound idea. Uh, idea one, uh, the first two characteristics are quite easy to understand. Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, right? So suffering is only the first one, okay? So it's not, not these three. So I hope that answers the question, yeah? Okay, you can look up the SD 1.1 again for the details if you missed out the things that I said, okay? Okay, thank you, Pia. Anyone else has questions? 
Maybe let me just add a bit more about the three sufferings we just not mentioned. Uh, we, we can, in simple language, we can talk the three kinds of suffering as uh, physical suffering. The, because of the nature of the body is physical, so we, we feel pain, right? Then there is mental suffering. Uh, for example, we, we something that we want, we can't get, we suffer. Something that we don't like, we get, we suffer. So it's mental suffering, number two. Then there is uh, something called spiritual suffering, if you like. Something we don't see, but it is always there. That this is the nature of the five aggregates, the pancha kanda. Okay? This is found in the Dhammachaka Sutta. You can look up SD 1.1, the very first sutta in the Sutta Discovery series. It is it deals with these three kinds of suffering. Okay. Okay, next question. Any more questions? I also ask questions about your know, meditation or anything that's related to the Dharma. Oh, there is one question from Sister Angeline Ong. Oh, okay. Sister Angeline Ong, you want to oh, ask just, the question in person? I just saw the question. And then, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, good evening, Brother Pia. And oh, and, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to, to know this concept. In, in Buddhism, we, we are always taught anatta, anicca. Uh, every, there's no one self that's permanent, but that is the concept of karma. When there's yeah. no self, there's still karma. Okay. Mm. Okay, so basically you're wondering, uh, how do we, who suffers as a result, right? If, if there's karma, there must be someone who suffers. Is that, is that what you're trying to say? Yes. Something like that? Okay. Yes. Now, if you, if you look at if we look at ourselves right now, we feel hot and cold, for example. Now, hot and cold are all changing, right? Whatever we experience are all changing. Is there anything you can think of right now that does not change? Nothing, right? Everything we experience is change, isn't it? Even when I'm talking now, everything is changing. Every moment, one word is changing, a sound changes. Only then you understand things. So all that you see is this series of changes, okay? This series of changes. Now, if you look at the series of changes, you cannot point your finger at anywhere and say, that's it, that's me. You can't because you are part of this process changing all the time. So... It is like uh, which direction we are going, right? It's like an airplane is flying. Then there's a strong wind, it moves a bit, pushed by the wind, okay? Then there is a bit of vacuum and then it falls, you know? So it's always moving, all right? Yeah, we say there's a plane, yeah. <clears throat> but even this plane is not permanent. Uh, it's subject to change, isn't it? So, in Buddhism, we say there is karma, but no one who suffers it. It's very strange way of talking. There is karma, but no one who suffers it. But still we feel the pain, see? Why do we see the pain? Because we own the pain, because we think there is a self. We say, oh, why am I suffering? Why do people do this to me? We use I, me, mine. Now, once you use I, me, my, it's the way we think. We say, I, I am suffering. You notice when you say, I am suffering, you suffer even more. So here, the Buddha teaches us not to own the pain, disown the pain, let go of the pain. You don't say my suffering, you just say, this is suffering, this is not good. So you, you see the suffering as it is, but you don't identify, you say, this is suffering. You see, a doctor doesn't identify with the pain. The doctor doesn't look at you and uh, say you have a wound. The doctor doesn't say, oh, wow, this is painful, huh? You never heard a doctor saying that, you see? The doctor will say, okay, let's look at it. Mm, this, is, this is serious, huh? You must be feeling quite painful, right? So this doctor, he looks at it, he examines it, but he doesn't identify with it. He doesn't get emotionally involved with it. 
he sees it as it really is. So we also should see our suffering, our karma as it really is, without identifying with it. There's no I, me, my. There is just this feeling coming and going. There is only feeling coming and going, arising and falling. That's all there is. If you find this still difficult, this is the most difficult idea I had to deal with when I was young, you know. No self. Like you, you know, I, I asked this question. I said, if there's no self, then who is the one experiencing all these things? Well, in a sense, no one, you see, but it's there. Next time you go to a lake, you sit quietly and watch the surface of the water, very smooth. And then something drops into the water. What do you see after that? You see this ripple, right? This ripple moving towards you, especially if a stone drops and then this ripple moves towards you. Waves, up, down, up, down, up, down, and then comes to you and then washes on the shore. Look at it from the start of the, where the stone drop and, and the circle wave, circle, circular wave move towards you, disappears. You think something is moving towards you. You think the wave is moving towards you. But when you look carefully, nothing is moving. All that's happening is the water is going up, down, up, down, up, down, and, and it gives you the illusion that it is moving. You, you get this idea? You got to watch this, reflect on it. A lot of understanding comes from watching the way nature works. There is the wave, and yet there is no wave. Same thing with the movies, you know, you watch the movie, those old satellite movie, the little square shape film, and the film moving very fast at a certain number of frames per second. You look at the screen and, and there is a story going on, you might even cry or laugh, depending. But nothing is moving. It's the illusion that is moving, you see. So our experience are like that. Our mind is moving all the time. There is no self, there is no I, this real being hiding behind us that experiences it. Because if that's the case, then how to attain nirvana? There is this being, you see, which is permanent, you know, right? So everything is impermanent. So these are some ideas for you to digest. I, I mean, it's not, not easy to answer, not easy to understand also, but I hope you, you have some idea here and you reflect on it. Okay, is that, is that possible? Yeah, okay, very good. You can also read up, uh, we, we have some articles on the non-self, you know, so if you want those articles, let me know. Just message me a message right now, we'll send the two or three articles on this, giving some more detail, very interesting reading on how the idea of non-self uh, can be understood. Okay, all right, next question. We still have a bit of time. Next, we have a question from Rachel. Rachel, please. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yes, Rachel. Um, so going on from what you just said, yeah. uh, then um, when, when people reincarnate or something, then what gets reincarnated? If it's the mind, then it's the mind not an individual thing. It's like, is it like everything? Uh, <laughs> I can't really phrase it. I've been actually thinking something like that, but she asked the question better than me. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, in a sense, uh, it, it's, it's more correct to say the mind is reborn rather than the body. Uh, we also don't use the word reincarnate because reincarnate is only one kind of rebirth. Reincarnate means to assume a, a, a body again, physical body. Because some kinds of rebirth are, are formless. Okay, so we use the word rebirth simply, actually. Uh, like I said, I, I think since you're doing psychology, you should read my, my couple of articles on non self. So uh, that may help you to understand on a deeper level. So just message us, we'll send those two articles to you on, on non self. You know? uh, mm. How the, I mean, how do we exist without a self, for example, okay? okay. In, in a sense, uh, let, let's just put it as a puzzle, you see? 
Let's say we don't know anything. So we, we guess, we say, okay, why don't we imagine we have this soul? You know? The next thing we've got to define what kind of soul is it? Does it exist inside our body, outside our body? Is it able to move it out, in and out whenever it likes? You know? uh, does it die with us? And so, so there's so many speculative, speculative ideas. So we don't have a fixed idea about this self. So it all depends on the religious experience of different teachers that they will start coming up with different ideas. The Buddha simply says, if you observe yourself, where is this soul? There's no such thing. There's nothing permanent. Everything is changing. Of course, we, we wish that there is something unchanging. Uh, the idea of continuity gives us the notion, give us the impression the, the, the idea that, oh, there must be something permanent. But people change, you know, even people can be different, you know? right? They appear to be the same, but they can change. And you say, I don't know this person. He's different, we say. But then it, that's your opinion. It's the same person standing in front of you, all right? They may not speaking. So this is a problem of language also. Am I the same but person? This is, like, this yeah, is what I was thinking, like, if you, if I'm, talking to somebody I tend like you naturally think you are you and that person's that person but yeah sure actually, if there's no such thing as like you're an individual then uh, mm -hmm. that person could oh, be you as yeah. well no, 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 no that's fine that's fine there is the conventional self there is a conventional self when we talk to each other yeah we say it's uh, by right we should be saying these five aggregates, form, really perception, formation, consciousness is talking. That's, that's quite a mouthful, isn't it? So we just use a simple symbol, I. I am talking to you. I mean, that's fine. But we should not take it too far that you are this unchanging entity. I am also this unchanging entity talking to another unchanging entity. It doesn't happen that way. We're all changing, changing all the time, talking to each other. Mm. See what I mean? Mm. The idea of change. Change is possible. But that person is not me still. It's oh, not yeah, just of, of everything. And it's not like, yeah. you know what I mean? I can see that person changing, but is that person still separate from me? Or, you know, that kind of um, thinking. Mm. A lot of, it's very instinctual to treat someone as separate yes. from you. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay, then then don't think about it. <laughs> <laughs> accept, accept the person. What I mean is, I didn't say don't think, I said don't think about it. Okay, that's different. So accept this person as he is. He's there, mm. there is happiness, there is sorrow, there is there are ideas, there is beauty, there's sadness, and you deal with that, you see. Right? Instead of saying, uh, what's going on uh, here? And then you, you don't see what really is going on. See what I mean? Mm. So deal with that person. What's that person? The person has form, feeling. You can know that. Perception is a bit difficult. Formation, a bit difficult. Consciousness, also difficult. But the first two, you can notice that. You can see the form of this person. You can notice the body language. Uh, you, you can notice the feelings and you deal with that. So in a sense, we're not dealing with the total person. We are only dealing with that feeling at that time. And we do counseling, it's the same thing, you know. Yeah, we try to see the whole person, uh, but that is towards the end when we reflect, you see. But at that moment, we are dealing with the present moment, sadness, joy, desperation, whatever, a question, you know. So we can't deal with the whole thing right now. Wow, that, that is impossible, see? So we are looking at a single frame at the moment, as it were, in this long movie called Life. Well, we are talking about life here, so it's not something simple <laughs> that you can put in one sentence, you know? Okay, non-self, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it is not that simple. We don't have, we don't need this, this gathering, this seminar. So it's something, because we think about this thing, which make us human, which make us wise, which, uh, where, because there is the Buddha, he, he thought of, about all this, he investigated. What is it there if there's no self? So he asked these questions. Okay. Right, okay thank you, Fia. Yeah, sure. Five more minutes. Uh, next, we, 
Uh, Vicky, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes. Uh, yes, Vicky. Yeah, you have a question? Uh, no, uh, you have to unmute yourself first. Unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brother Pia, uh, yes. can I ask this question? Uh, just now you mentioned that if we have wrong view, then we are ended up in lower ranks. <laughs> so if we don't even know that we have wrong view, uh, though, though we are changing or correcting our views every time. Um, uh, okay. Like karma yeah. is tricky. You see? It's not like <laughs> the moment you have a wrong view, zap, you become a cow or a rat <laughs> or, or a cat. It's not like that. Here we're talking about habitually doing it, habitually doing it, and then passing away. Okay? So it's a habitual thing. Someone who always, no matter what, the person keeps on thinking this negative way. Right? But you notice most of us we, we we are very complicated we have we change our views and then we we can learn things we adjust the way we think right we, we don't always have something very fixed you know? that's what i mean but the moment you notice you have something fixed which is negative then you tell yourself okay uh, let me change this i don't think we have that kind of idea that we're very fixed with a certain a, a bad idea we may for a while, maybe we we're angry with someone, we say, oh, I hate this guy, and it's like this, but there's an idea for a while. And then later you find he, he's changed and you realize uh, you found out the truth and then you change your opinion. So all that we do, we have this idea which we are willing to change. So the idea is accept what's going on uh, as it is and then ask what's going on here and then correct it. Now, if you can do that, you will not fall into the subhuman planes because you, you accept change, right? So that's the meaning. Do, do not let the karma catch you caught in a rut. In other words, you, you are stuck with just one idea and you keep thinking on that, okay? In fact, uh, only mad people do that. They're caught in one idea only, you know? okay? So... So don't worry, we are quite safe in that <laughs> sense. <laughs> it's just okay. like one examining and reflecting on impermanence. Okay. Now these teachings are not to frighten you. These teachings are to remind us we are capable of serious thinking, of correcting our views, of noticing how we think, and improving the way we think. That's the meaning. All right. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much, Pia. I think we have no more questions and it's time already. Shall mm -hmm. we uh, get everyone to turn on their videos? Oh yes, please. Uh, okay, video time. Turn on your video so we can get a nice time of view. Yeah, so nice to see everyone. Today is Saturday, right? So tomorrow have a good weekend. Yeah, it's good to see. The faces, sweet faces. Okay. Okay, now please look at the screen and smile. Mm -hmm. Last night, unfortunately, the photo was not recorded. So, oh. so sorry. Okay, okay today, uh, just very good. Smile. Yes, okay. One more. One, two, three, smile. Thank you. All right. So now we can close, right? Okay. Let me share the slide. <clears throat> Closing slides. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. All right, now we come to this, the end of the class as usual. Let us remember how we have got it together today in peace, seeking to understand ourselves better. We have recited the precepts and done some meditation and also listened to the Dhamma. 
deeds and all wonderful good deeds. By all these good deeds we have done, may we be well and happy. May we have a clear mind to think things right so that greater joy arises in us and wherever we go, we bring this joy with us to make others happy too. It is a time for you to send your thoughts of loving kindness, well wishes to your loved ones, to others who matter to you, wherever they may be. This is a very good time to do that. And now let us close by showing our gratitude to the three jewels for whom we are gathered here by bowing down to the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. Arahang Sama Sam Buddha Bhagawa Buddhang Bhagawantang Abhiwademi Bow down. Swakato Bhagavata Dhammu Dhammang Namasami Bow down. Supati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sango Sangang Namami Bow down. Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu. Okay, so have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you, Teacher Thank you. Priya. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ratna. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night.